in order to understand this passage, we'll first go through the last two lines of the passage. What does it say? Human made things are behaving more lifelike and life is becoming more engineered. You see, that is the germ, the kernel of the passage. In the entire passage is talking about what are we doing? We are trying to make machines more human-like and life has become more like machines. The opposition between biology and technology. Biology refers to our life and technology refers to man-made things. He's talking about these things in this passage. Now, if you look at the beginning of the passage, you see he tells us that nature has given us so many things, food, fiber, shelter, everything. And then what we did was we exploited nature. And then we, exploiting nature, we drew materials out of nature and made artificial materials. Uh, what has happened is we are making use of our minds in order to make use of nature. Now, in the second paragraph, He's talking about biology. Uh, he simply says here that is what has what has been happening. It's a clockwork logic, the logic of the machines building simple contrivances. And what have we done here? He says here that truly complex systems such as a cell, a meadow, an economy, or a brain require a rigorous non-technological logic. We now see that no logic except biologic can assemble a thinking device or even a workable system of any man, right? Now, he goes on to discuss, you see that we are trying to rediscover logic in biology and we want to discover something useful. And the last line of the second paragraph gives you a very good idea of what he is trying to say. He says, so far, some of the traits of the living that have successfully been transported to mechanical systems like self-replication, self-governance, limited self-affair, mild evolution and partial learning. That is what we have done is we have made our machines, our mechanical systems in such a way that it resembles, you see, our biological life. That is the point he makes here. And then look what he says in the third paragraph. He says here, yet at the same time that the logic of bios is being imported into machines, the logic of technos is being imported into life. Uh, the point that I made, that is the central idea of the passage. I told you that human beings are behaving what you call human-made things, you see, are behaving more lifelike. Machines are behaving more lifelike and life is being more machine-like, being engineered. That is the point he makes here. And he explains that giving examples in this paragraph. In the next paragraph, he's talking about genetic engineering and what have we done you see by using the genetic method it has brought about an artificial evolution at the beginning i took up the final paragraph and i pointed out that it is more or less a submission of what's been discussed in the entire passage so now i hope you understand what the passage is about we can come to the questions the first one none of the following statements is implied by the arguments of the passage except except one. The other statements aren't implied by the arguments in the passage. Let's see. Purposeful design represents the pinnacle of scientific expertise in the service of human betterment and civilization progress. No, this isn't implied. Historically, philosophers have known that the laws of life can be abstracted and applied elsewhere. This isn't applied. Implied. Now, what do you mean by if implication? You see, the point is, if you have to understand the central idea of the passage, then, then you draw, you see, uh, certain implications they come up the third one genetic engineers and bioengineers are the same in so far as they both seek to force evolution in an artificial way and that is what he said in the fifth paragraph uh, he talks about how modern genetic engineers can be you can use directed artificial evolution so that is the implication here so number three is the correct option the Biological realm is as complex as the mechanical one, 
Well, which is why the logic of BIOS is being imported into the machine. So that is not an implication. The implication is number three. The next question, which one of the following sets of phrases, words, phrases best serves as keywords to the passage? Now, if you look carefully in the cluster of these words, you will see number two is the correct option. Why? Because you have the complex system, biologic, which is discussed there, bioengineering, which is discussed there, technos, logic, and cut. The other groups leave one or the other phrase or words which are important. Like number one doesn't talk about biologic or bioengineering. It doesn't talk about that. Number three, again, doesn't talk about that. And number four, you see, it doesn't talk about what you call the complex. They leave one or the other. So the best one is number two. Let's look at the next question. The author claims that the apparent veil between the organic and the manufactured has crumpled to reveal that the two really are and have always been of one being. That is the bios and the techno, right? Which one of the following statements best expresses the point being made by the author here? Apparent and reality and organic reality are distinguished by the fact that the former is manufactured. Uh, it's not the question of apparent and organic, you see. So I think number one cannot be the answer. Scientific advances are making it increasingly difficult to distinguish between organic reality and manufactured reality. So number two is the correct option here because it's a scientific advances. Organic reality has crumpled under the veil of manufacturing, rendering the apparent and the real as the same being. No. The crumpling of the organic well veil between apparent and manufactured reality reveals them to have the same being. No, uh, the correct option is number two. Now let's take the next question. He says here the author claims part of this bionic convergence is a matter of words. Which one of the following statements best expresses the point being made by the author? Uh, the point that he makes is part of the bionic convergence is a matter of words. Let's see. Bios and technos are both convergent forms of logic, but they generate meanings about the world that are mutually exclusive. No, a bionic convergence indicates the meeting ground of genetic engineering and artificial intelligence. No, at this point is not expressed there. Mechanical and life are words from different logical systems and are therefore fundamentally incompatible in meaning. No, the next one, mechanical and life were is earlier seen as opposite in meaning, but the difference between the two is increasingly blurred. Uh, that is the point he's trying to make. So number four is the correct option. Now let's look at the next paragraph. This paragraph basically talks about how rapid changes, alterations, social changes could be dramatic and could lead to social disorganization and, and which will result in high levels of what you call crime, high rates of crime and delinquency. That's what he's talking about. That's Geologists, you see, who were working, they found out that uh, they researched and they found out that rapid or dramatic social change causes increasing increases in crime. And of course, he goes on to give examples, right? And uh, to tell you that crime rate increases whenever there is a high level of social disorganization. In the next paragraph, he talks about the rural and the urban fields and in the second paragraph, in the next, that is, he talks about the migration, uh, people coming from the villages, keeping people coming from down south, and people, you see, immigrating. Now, you have a lot of migrants, you have got a lot of immigrants, right? And he's talking about, you see, uh, Chicago here. And because of all this movement, there was a disorganized influence on the people, on the population there. And there was what you call a disruption between the social and urban life. Now, he points out what has happened is with such 
big movements this result resulted in social disorganization and also an increase in crimes he carries the same point he pursues the same point in the next paragraph giving more examples when he is talking about the movement from uh, the south to the north and this again you see this movement which went uncontrolled right and some of the people they started you see living as natives the others couldn't but again there was a kind of social disorganization and that resulted in they made made it more crimogenic he says here failure to integrate these migrants coupled with other forces of social disorganization such as crowding poverty illness caused crime rates to climb in the cities i am i read out this line from the last but one paragraph you see and finally he talks about that the foreign immigrants you see were no different from the indigenous immigrants even when he is talking about the combination of rapid population growth with the diversity of those moving into the cities created what the chicago school sociologists called the social disorganization so uh, time and again he emphasizes you see this word social disorganization because that seems to be the source of a uh, generation of high rate of crimes so now let's come to the questions here the author notes that at the start of the 20th century americans were predominantly a rural population but by the century's midpoint most lived in urban areas which one of the following statements if true does not contradict this statement Okay, number one, demographic transition in America in the 20th century is strongly marked by an output migration from rural areas. The estimation of per capita income in America in the mid 20th century primarily required data from rural areas. Well, I don't know uh, what has this statement to do with what he has asked in the question. So, number two cannot be the answer. A population census conducted in 1952 showed that more Americans lived in rural areas than in urban areas. Um, that could be a point, but then that doesn't answer the point that he has raised in the question, whether it contradicts the statement or not. And the last one, economists have found that throughout the 20th century, the size of the labor force in America has always been largest in the rural areas. No. Uh, the correct answer is number 1 demographic transition in america in the 20th century is strongly marked by an out migration from rural areas that is the correct option the next question a fundamental con conclusion by the author is that what is the conclusion that he draws let us see rapid growth population growth and demographic diversity give rise to social disorganization that can feed the growth of crime uh, this is what I, uh, the passage has been emphasizing and this is what i have been telling you see that from the passage uh, this is the main point and number 1 is the correct option now we can come to the next question uh, he says here which one of the following is not a valid inference from the passage not a valid the differences between urban and rural lifestyles were crucial factors in the disruption experienced by migrant to american city yes uh, this is uh, is a is a kind of inference so this cannot be the answer according to social disorganization theory the fast paced social things provide fertile ground for the rapid growth of crime uh, well let's look at the third one according to social disorganization theory the social integration of african american migrants into the chicago was slower because they were less organized so this is not a valid inference from the passage so number 3 is the correct option the next one which one of the following sets of words phrases best encapsulates the issues discussed in the passage uh, well if you look at the words and phrases i think number 2 has the most of them chicago school social organization migration crime all these things are covered in the others you don't have number 1 doesn't talk about migration or social organization which is a very important thing and number 3 and 4 don't don't talk about that they don't have the words there so number 2 is the correct option now we come to the next passage it's about you see the orientalism now what do you mean by orientalism orientalism is actually you see the perception 
perception of the Orient, the perception of India in particular by the Western powers, by the colonial powers. So what he is talking about in this passage is what influences you see did the colonial powers you see had in interpreting in in interpreting Orientalism, what Orientalism is exactly and how Orientalism you see is in a way a reply to the colonial domination by the colonial powers. So the point is how Orientalism works. If you look into the first paragraph, interpretations of the Indian past were inevitably influenced by colonial concerns and interests. That is what I told you. You see how the past in India is interpreted that was influenced a great deal by the colonial and European powers because they were ruling over uh, the country and they were giving their own interpretation of the colonial pa of the Indian past. That is the thing. Now, Orientalism was something fantastic to the Europeans. The point is, you see, the uh, European possibly, you see, uh, could, talk, could have talked about or could have been under the influences of uh, Romanticism right? uh, as opposed to Neoclassicism. But uh, when they started studying the Orientals, the Oriental refers to the Asiatic countries, most of them, and India in particular. You see, when the Europeans started engaging uh, themselves in the study of Indian literature, Indian philosophy, uh, they suddenly realized this is a kind of a new fantasy, a kind of new romance, kind of new romantic paradigm. They thought that now it is a new kind of renaissance their acquaintance with the Orient because everything was strange. Everything was new for them when they studied, you see, the Oriental past. And somehow it was a relief. It is. It was an escape from all kind of rationality and logic because here was a world of myth, a world of religion, a world of spiritualism. So uh, the definitely you see that they felt a new kind of experience being associated with uh, Orientalism. And possibly it was because of this that the English romantic poets like Wordsworth, Coleridge, right? They were afraid that because of industrialization, uh, this kind of romanticism would disappear, that they turned to nature and to the fantasies of the Orient. They were looking to the Orient, you see, to the Oriental past. Now, the thing is, he in the third paragraph, he's talking about this enthusiasm gradually changed to conform with emphasis later in the 19th century on the innate superiority of European civilization. Now, what does that mean? I read out that line in order to tell you that the Oriental was something different, something separate. But with the European interpretation of Orientalism, with the European influences on Orientalism, uh, what started happening was the interpretation of the Orient was done in accordance with the wishes, in accordance with the desires or the instructions of the European colonial powers. And what was the result of this? The result was this, that the Oriental philosophy, the Oriental tradition and culture uh, seemed to be in a poor light in decline. The various phases of Orientalism tended to mold European understanding of the Indian past into a particular pattern. There was an attempt to formulate Indian culture as uniform, such formulations being derived from texts that were given priority. And what did they do? They wanted to bring out a uniformity uh, and they wanted to show uh, the entire Indian culture, you see, from some selected text from Sanskrit literature. And of course, when it comes to myth, there was an interpretation uh, that shows that, well, they are going to emphasize the non-historical aspects of Indian culture. Uh, that is the non-historical culture aspect means that is the mythical aspect. And one thing they came up with the point is that for at least 3000 years, for over 3000 years, you see, there was a society in India, you see, a continuous society and religion, and it was colored with metaphysics and uh, religious belief that they couldn't attend to other things. The point is the European interpretation of the Orientalism. They've, they argued that, well, uh, the people of this country 
thousands of years ago have been only paying attention to philosophy to religion to the subtleties of religion to philosophy to spiritualism to metaphysics and they had no time for other aspects that is the interpretation and then he talks about how german romanticism endorsed this image of india because the germans were studying indian culture they in a way you see endorsed this idea of a, a india you see and it became the mystic land for many europeans where even the most ordinary actions were imbued with a complex symbolism so the point is for the europeans for the white men you see this was a country of mystery of myths of secrets of occultism they wanted to explore more and more but the unfortunate thing is the more they explored they came up with their own interpretations that was the problem there right and this resulted in calling the east spiritual and the west material a dichotomy was maintained indian values being described as spiritual and european values as material you see that is the point there was a dichotomy there was an opposition the more they studied the indian culture uh, they found out well this is all about is spiritualism and the european culture had to do with materialism and this of course you see has been reinforced by many scholars and philosophers so the last paragraph says it was a consolation to the indian intelligentsia for its perceived inability to counter the technical superiority of the west now this was a consolation what kind of consolation because at that time india was under the rule of the european but it was a consolation that they were treated as spiritual their culture their tradition their metaphysics their religion they were attended to and this was a consolation because uh, we weren't in a position to stand against the west in in what you call technology uh, a superiority because of the technical superiority you see europe was able to colonize asia and parts of the world so this was a kind of compensation for us a consolation for us at least that we were uh, one of those nations uh, which were you see uh, from time memorial spiritualistic religious metaphysical and so can now come to the uh, questions now here and the first question that i am taking up is which one of the following styles of research is most similar to the orientalist scholar's method of understanding indian history and culture uh, he is giving you an example from another another field to compare with what he is talking about the research you see in oriental scholars you see done by the oriental scholars so let us look at these options here reading about the life of early american settlers and later waves of uh, immigration to understand the evolution of american culture no that's incorrect uh, the second one studying artifacts excavated at a palace to understand the lifestyle of those who lived there no that's analyzing hollywood action movies that depict violence and sex to understand contemporary america you see uh, that is the correct option that is the correct option that is the research method you see that's that was used uh, you see in understanding indian history and culture right reading 18th century accounts by travelers no that's not the correct option next question it can be inferred from the passage that to gain a more accurate view of the nation's history and culture scholars should do all of the following except uh, well if you uh, start from number 4 examine their own beliefs and biases yes they could do it read widely in countries literature okay examine the complex reality of the nation society yes develop an oppositional framework to grasp cultural differences no that is the exception so that is the answer you see number 1 is the answer in the context of the passage all of the following statements are true except what orientalist scholarship influenced indians yes it did orientalist understanding of indian history was linked to colonial concerns that's correct india spiritualism served as a salve for european colonizers no it india spiritualism served as a salve for indians against the technicalist the technical superiority of the europeans you see which is out in the third paragraph the first two lines of the third paragraph he talks about so number 3 is the correct option and 
and Indian text influenced Oriental scholars? That is true. The next question, it can be inferred from the passage that the author is not likely to support the view that. Wh what is the view that he wouldn't support? India's culture has evolved over the centuries. No, the Orientals, Orientalist view of Asia fired the imagination of Western po poets. Indian culture acknowledges the material aspects of life. India became a colony, although it matched the technical knowledge of the West. This is something it doesn't support the view. So number four is the correct option. Now let's come to the next passage. And in this passage, he's talking about the use of our own mind and the use of software. And of course, he is talking about certain things. I'll just read out some important sentences you see from the passage to explicate the whole thing. And you'll understand it well. For instance, in the first paragraph, he says, as software improves, the people using it become less likely to sharpen their know-how. Okay, that is, people start losing their original abilities, you see, once they get into mechanization or once they get into what you call uh, easy know-hows, you see. Applications that offer lots of prompts and tips are often to blame. Simpler, less solicitous programs push people harder to think, uh, act, and learn. So he gives you a comparison here. You see, the less solicitous programs, you see, that make people think, and they work there. Now, he carries on the same point, you see, in the second paragraph, uh, where he says, look at this sentence. The researchers found that the people using the simple software developed better strategies, fewer mistakes, and developed a deeper aptitude for work. That is, people who used the simple, uh, what you call, uh, software, and people who use the more advanced software uh, would aimlessly click around uh, when confronted with a tricky problem. So the supposedly helpful software actually short-circuited their thinking and learning. Now what he's saying is, what he says here is, uh, the more advanced software you see interferes with the human abilities to think, the human abilities to act and makes them, tricks them into laziness, whereas the less sophisticated software or the less helpful software pushes, you see, human beings to think and act for themselves. That is the point he makes here. And he carries on with this point uh, in the third paragraph where he says our uh, skills get sharper only through practice when we use them regularly to overcome different sorts of difficult challenges. Uh, so if we just uh, depend on only software to do our work, uh, then uh, these skills may not be sharpened or they may not be honed, you see, properly. And then... Uh, in the next paragraph, which begins with nevertheless, he's uh, pursuing the same uh, thought. And uh, he talks about uh, how the medical fraternity is making use of these advanced softwares. And uh, they have that has resulted in sometimes misdiagnosis, wrong diagnosis. And he cites the instance of, you see, the first person to die of uh, the Ebola virus, you see. Uh, the medical software, uh, he says, the right is no replacement for basic history taking examination skills and critical thinking you see it interferes with the doctors you see original way of thinking and doing things uh, when they have a software of this kind uh, which just you see works by uh, when you feed information into it so it actually he is illustrating you see what he has said uh, you see about um, the software interfering with human endeavors human uh, work. So the last paragraph is repeating the same point. Uh, there is an alternative human centered automation. The talents of people take precedence in this model. Software plays an essential but secondary role. Uh, so he's emphasizing that the same thing. You see, it takes over routine functions that a human operator has already mastered issues as issues alerts when unexpected situations arise provides them fresh information. And the last line he says the technology becomes the expert's partner, not the expert's replacement. So if the technology becomes a substitute for the expert, then uh, there may be problems there. And that is how he sums up the entire uh, idea. There. Now let's come to the questions here. From the passage, we can infer that the author is apprehensive 
about the use of sophisticated automation for all of the following reasons except that uh, it stops users from exercising their minds that's okay it stunts the development of its user that's correct it could mislead people yes yeah. uh, the exception is last one computers could replace humans that's the last one. the next question in the context of the passage all of the following can be considered examples of human centered automation except now three of them are human centered automation only one isn't let us see medical software that provides optional feedback on the doctor's analysis of medical situation no software that offers interpretations when requested by the human operator no uh, software that auto complete text when the user writes an email yes that is the answer a smart home system that changes the temperature as instructed by the resident no uh, that is the answer number 3 the next one it can be inferred that in utrecht utrecht university experiment one group of people was aimlessly clicking around because why i mean it's a very simple thing they were you have that sentence there uh, they were aimlessly clicking around or moving around Uh, why? Uh, because they were hoping that the software could help carry out the task. They were waiting for the software to uh, carry out the task. I mean, that is an obvious answer. The next one in the Ebola misdiagnosis, which he has talked about, I think, in the what you call the last but one paragraph. You see, uh, the second last paragraph. He has talked about it. We can infer that the doctors probably missed the forest for trees because they were led by data processed by digital templates. They weren't depending on their uh, clinical reasoning or clinical observations or history taking or examination skills or critical thinking. They weren't doing that. Uh, they were misled because uh, the, by the data processed by digital templates. I mean that is an obvious uh, answer. So number one is the correct option. Now let's look at the next question. It says here, bringing workers back to their desks has been a rocky road for employers and employees alike. Okay, the evolution of the pandemic has meant that best laid plans have often not materialized. The flow of workers back into offices has been more of a trickle than a steady stream. Yet, while plenty companies are now, I don't, we don't see the consequence of yet. You see, uh, I mean, the flow of workers back into the offices has been more of a trickle than a steady stream. Then you say, yet while plenty of companies are still working through their new policies, how is yet connected to the preceding sentence? You see, it's not connected because. the the preceding sentence is talk about uh, workers you see the flow of workers being very uh, little so here you can accommodate this sentence this has meant a lot of uncertainty around what a wide scale return to the office might look like in practice now this connects very well so number 2 is the correct option you can put it here now let's look at the next exercise and he says here to defend the sequence of alpha alpha production may seem bizarre so obvious is its application that it is hard to imagine a reference catalog or listing without it that is uh, arranging everything in alphabetical but alphabetical order was not an immediate consequence of the alphabet itself in the middle ages difference for the ecclesiastical tradition left scholars reluctant to categorize things according to the alphabet to do so would be a rejection of the divine order the rediscovery of the ancient greek and roman classics necessitated more efficient ways of ordering searching and referencing text government bureaucracy in the 16th and 17th centuries quickened the advance of alph alphabetical order bringing with it pigeonholes notebooks and cards so if you look at the options here um he's talking about the sequence of uh, alphabeting things you see the first one says the alphabetic order took several centuries to gain common currency because of religious beliefs and a lack of depreciation of its efficacy in the ordering of things okay i think number 1 the best summary because if you look at number 2 unlike the alphabet once the efficacy of the alphabetic sequence became apparent to scholars and its use became widespread uh well it doesn't cover the whole thing you see the part has to do with the religious beliefs and other things and 
uh, third and four, you see they have the same kind of um, problem. The ban on the use by scholars of any form of categorization delayed the adoption of alpha. So it doesn't take up the whole point, you see, the efficacy in ordering things. So number one is the correct option. Now let's come to the next question. And you've got to properly sequence it. He says here, if I wanted to sit indoors, and read or play Sonic, the hedgehog on a red hot Sega Mega Drive, I would often be made to feel guilty about not going outside to enjoy it while it lasts. My, my, my mom quite reasonably wanted me and my sister out of the house in the sun. Okay. Tales of my mom's idyllic sounding childhood in the Sussex countryside where trees were climbed by 8 a.m. and streams navigated by lunchtime were passed down to us like folk folklore. And then to an in introverted kid that left felt like a threat. Uh, and the feeling has stayed with me. What feeling? Um, we don't know. We have to look for it. So uh, if you read it carefully, uh, somehow you see the indoor and outdoor are connected. So in that sense, number two should be the first sentence. My mom quite reasonably wanted me and my sister out of the house in the sun. Right. Uh, this connects very well uh, with what number two. Three, tales of my mom's idyllic sounding childhood in Sussex countryside uh, that came as a folklore. And then he talks about that uh, if he wanted to sit indoors, that is number one. And the last one is number four. So it should be two, three, one and four. Uh, we can take up the next cluster of sentences. And here he says, the more we are able to accept that all our achievements are largely out of our control, the easier it becomes to understand that our failures and those of others are too. Okay. Uh, but the raft of recent books. No, we can't start the sentence with but the raft of, raft of recent books. I mean, if you're saying but, that means you have argued some, uh, there's some argument in some other sense. And the last one, and, you can't start it with, and that in turn should increase our humility. What, what in turn? So uh, out of the options available here, between one and three, uh, three is... Uh, the better option you see meritocracy as an organizing principle is an inevitable function of a free society as we are designed to see our achievements as worthy of this is a general statement about meritocracy okay and after this we have the sentence he has talked about meritocracy as an organizing principle and then he talks about the limits of merit in number two so in that way number two should follow uh, about the limits of merit is an important correction so three followed by two followed by one uh, because what you are talking about in two is the raft of recent books about the limits of merit is an important correction to the arrogance of contemporary entitlement and an opportunity to reassert the importance of luck or grace in our thinking. And then he says, the more we are able to accept that our achievements are largely out of our control. Uh, it's, uh, and of course, three, two, and one, and four. That in turn, right? That is the last one, number four. The next one, he says here that uh, uh, various industrial sectors, including a uh, retail transit system, a beacon fixed onto a shop wall enables the retailer to assess the proximity of the consumer that come up with such targeted or personal communications. Okay. Uh, smartphones or other mobile devices can capture the beacon signals. Okay. Beacons are tiny. So now you can understand he's talking about in general, I think his, his main emphasis is on the beacons. So in that sense, you see four should be the first sentence. He first explains what beacons are. They can set radio frequency signals and so forth. And then he talks about a particular, gives you a, uh, what do you call a particular example, how you see beacon signals can be captured. So four should be followed by three. You can look at the connection, you see. Bluetooth devices of their presence and transmit information. Smartphones or other mobile devices can capture the beacon signal. Okay. Uh, it should be four followed by three. And then you have number one followed by number two. That 
that is the correct order here. Four, three, one, two. Now let's look at the uh, next question. The sentence says, when people socially learn from each other, they often learn without understanding why, what they are copying, the belief and, and behaviors and technologies and know-how works, right? So you have two hyphens, you see dashes. So what the sentence stands is, they often learn without understanding why what they are copying, you see, and how it all works. The dual inheritance theory says that inheritance is itself an evolutionary system. It has variation. What makes us a new kind of animal and so different and successful as a species is we rely heavily on social learning to the point where socially acquired information is effectively a second line of inheritance, the first being our genes. Okay. And then he says, people tend to home in on who seems to be the smartest or most successful person around as well as what everybody seems to be doing. The majority of people have something worth learning. And of course, when you repeat this process, that is the process of learning. So there is no scope of, uh, you, you see, uh, accommodating the sentence in number three or even in number four. Uh, the correct option here is number two, where you can possibly accommodate this sentence. When you are talking about, uh, you see, when people socially learn from each other and so forth. Now, let's come to the next question. It does seem to me the job of comedy is to offend or have the potential to offend and it cannot be drained of that potential. Rowan Atkinson said of the cancel phase culture, every joke has a victim. That's the definition of a joke. Someone or something or an idea is made up to look ridiculous. The Netflix star continued, I think you have got to be very, very careful about saying what you're allowed to make jokes about. You have always got to kick up, really. He added, there are lots of extremely smug and unself-satisfied people in what would be deemed lower down in society who also deserve to be pulled up. In a proper free society, you should be allowed to make jokes about absolutely anything. Now, he has taken up so many points here. That is, what is the job of comedy and what are jokes, right? He has taken up these things here. Let's see which one covers all the points. Every joke needs a victim and one needs to include people from lower down the society, not just the upper class, okay? All jokes target someone and one should be able to joke about anyone in the society which is inconsistent with cancel culture. So I think uh, that is the best option you see in this because you see states in a very clear and concise manner what is stated in the paragraph. Three says victims of jokes must not only be politicians and royalty but also arrogant people. Uh, that's not the point. I mean the whole thing is contained in number two. Now let's come to the next one. And he talks about Tamsin Blanchard, curator of Fashion Open Studio, an initiative by a campaign group showcasing the work of ethical designer says. What does he say? Uh, we are all drawn to an ex exquisite piece of embroidery, a colorful textile, or even a style of dressing that might have originated from another heritage. Okay, but this magpie mentality where all of culture and history is up for grabs as inspiration has accelerated since the pro proliferation of social media. Okay, uh, where once a fashion student might research the history and traditions of a particular item of clothing with care and respect, we now have a world where images are lifted from image libraries without a care for their cultural significance. It's easier than ever to steal a motive for a craft technique and transfer it on a piece of clothing that is either mass produced or appears on runway without credit or compensation to their original community. Let's look at the options here. Taking fashion ideas from any cultural group without their consent is a form of appropriation without giving due credit, compensation and respect. So he has summed up the whole thing in one sentence, you see. What he has stated, you see that uh, lifting or stealing you see he has talked about that and uh, that seems to be the best option here number one uh, the others you see they don't talk about 
uh, as shortly as what has been stated. You see, the others might contain, if I read out the others, they might contain some items. But the problem is when you're looking to the summary, you must look to its briefness, to the language, the kind of language that is used there. I mean, the language is terse and well-defined language. So number one, you see, is the correct option 